Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to this week's EPI seminar. So we are very pleased to have a Dr. Stefanos Portis from the University of Sherbrooke present uh, the talk today. So uh, Stefanos obtained his undergraduate degree and his master's degree in Greece at the uh, National Technical University of Athens. And then he moved to Germany to uh, work on his PhD degree and obtain his degree from the uh, Dresden University of Technology in 2014 in physics. And then he moved on to a first uh, postdoctoral position. So this was a fellowship awarded by ICAM, the Institute for Complex Adaptive, uh, Adaptive Matter. And he split his time between uh, the UK, so the Cavendish Lab at Cambridge, and also uh, in the US so working at Princeton University. And then did a second postdoc at Boston University. And uh, so uh, is currently an assistant professor at uh, the University of Sherbrooke in the Department of Physics. Uh, so Stefanos has worked broadly in the condensed matter theory. So he's worked on frustrated magnetism, topological phases of matter, strongly correlated systems, and also has uh, developed uh, novel numerical methods for quantum materials and quantum information. And today he will be telling us about some of this uh, work on this very exciting uh, method that is quite broadly applicable throughout theoretical physics, uh, which is the notion of the tensor network. So uh, welcome, Stefanos, and uh, please take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Joseph. Um, thank you all for, for having me. Um, it's the first time I've ever visited um, Alberta virtually or otherwise. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I will be talking to you about um, uh, classical and quantum computation um, expressed as, uh, as a structure called a tensor network. Um, before, before I get into the, um, the material itself, I want to start with a couple of disclaimers. And um, the first disclaimer is uh, that this talk is going to be simple and uh, it's going to be easy to follow. Uh, I say this because uh, from my experience, many uh, tensor network talks um, uh, very often uh, start with introducing some diagrammatic notation and then uh, they, uh, they, uh, the, the speaker uh, loses track uh, because they've seen this a million times and they add more and more and more and more diagrams and uh, in the end uh, people get lost. Uh, so. It is my promise to you that uh, by the end of this talk, you'll understand what a tensor network is and also how it can be used to express and enact uh, computation, whether that computation is a classical computation or the simulation of a, of a, of a quantum computation. And um, so I've, I've planned this talk uh, in this way. There will be some results uh, that I will show you in the end about some algorithms we have developed, but uh, I don't need to go through all the slides and also the results uh, in a sense are a secondary effect of, the, of, uh, of this talk. So, so that's the first disclaimer. The second disclaimer is encapsulated in this paragraph uh, from, uh, from the preface of this book that I will now read to you. For a long time, computer scientists have distinguished between fast and slow algorithms. Fast, or good algorithms are the algorithms that run in polynomial time, which means that the number of steps required for the algorithm to solve a problem is bounded by some polynomial in the length of the input. All other al algorithms are slow or bad. The running time of slow algorithms is usually exponential. This book is about bad algorithms. So um, I, I like this quote because it sets the expectations Frequently, uh, physicists, uh, especially condensed matter physicists, have a mindset that works only in polynomial time. And uh, I want to make it clear from the beginning that this is not the case. So this talk is going to be about bad algorithms uh, in this sense. OK, now we have these uh, disclaimers out of the way. Uh, here's what I will be talking to you um, about. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce what is a tensor. Then I will introduce what is a tensor network. Then uh, I will show you how um, these, uh, these uh, structures called tensor networks are expressive enough uh, to, to model uh, computations. And uh, I will focus on two examples in this talk. Uh, I will start with quantum circuits. 
and I'll use quantum circuits as a general playground to, uh, to show you um, what kind of tensor networks one ends up with in this case and what algorithms we can use to, 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 to model and simulate these, these uh, quantum computations uh, in quantum circuits. And then uh, I will uh, take a step back and uh, go to classical computation and uh, I will talk about a particular example called model counting which I will introduce. Um, and then I will show you some results and, and that's it. And um, one thing that I, I wanted to, to mention is that uh, uh, please feel free to interrupt. Uh, I've planned uh, plenty of time uh, for, for discussion and, and questions. I'll do my best to answer any questions um, that you may have. Okay, so uh, what is a tensor? A tensor is a multidimensional array. So uh, for programmers, this is, uh, this is a particularly simple concept. And so here I, I'm showing one example uh, of a tensor, a rank three tensor T. This, uh, this tensor has three indices, I, J, K, and each index can take a certain number of values um, as written here. And when one fixes all the indices, one gets back a scalar. And in this case, uh, for this example, this scalar is a complex, just a complex number. So um, one way to represent uh, these, these uh, tensors diagrammatically is shown here, uh, where uh, I draw a tensor as a blob and I have, uh, I have the indices, um, which I am free to choose as legs sticking out of the blob. And um, we are more familiar in general with, with, um, with particular uh, types of tensors. And uh, these are matrices and vectors. And so I can represent uh, matrices and vectors in a, in a similar way. So here I have this Tij, I have two free indices and therefore this, this uh, corresponds to, to a matrix and I can draw it like this. And the same for a vector with one free index. Okay. Now, what is a tensor network? Um, a tensor network is simply a to-do list of tensor multiplications, which in the field are called contractions. Um, what do I mean by a, by a to-do list? So the best way to illustrate this is by, by giving you some examples. And the, the, one of the simplest examples of, uh, of contractions is, uh, is the matrix vector multiplication that I'm showing here. So I have a vector V uh, and I wanna multiply it by a matrix and uh, I get back another vector uh, W. Okay, so if I write the indices explicitly, basically I'm multiplying and, uh, and summing over, over the common index of the vector and the matrix, right? And in a diagramma diagrammatic uh, notation, uh, I write these two things as the blobs that I showed you before, a two-legged blob for the matrix and a one-legged blob for the vector. And in this diagrammatic notation, whenever there is a, there is a bond that links two of the, two of the dots, um, this, this uh, represents um, a contraction. Okay, so the name of the game is, in the end, any, any bond that uh, has endpoints being these, uh, these dots, then that needs to be contracted. So um, here's an example uh, of this where I have uh, two bonds that connect uh, uh, matrices like this here uh, in the bottom. Um, and so I have to, to, to perform these two uh, matrix multiplications, okay? So um, again, this is simply just multiplying uh, and summing over, over common indices. And here I have a freedom of, uh, for how to do this. So the tensor network basically is just, as I said, a to-do list. And, um, and then uh, on top of that, I need to decide uh, in what order to go through this list. So for example, here I decide to multiply the A and B matrices first. I get this AB matrix and then I multiply AB with C 
to get the, the final matrix. Now, as you might imagine, the, the order, uh, here the order, if, if all, uh, all dimensions of the matrices are, uh, that I'm multiplying are the same, then the order doesn't really matter in a computational sense. It's, uh, the result is always the same. Uh, but in general, the order of contractions matters. So if you think of the to-do list as you going uh, to the grocery store and having to get all these things, and you don't want to spend, you want to spend as little time as possible, then you're facing something like a traveling salesman problem where you have to go uh, uh, to all the aisles uh, such that you conserve uh, as much time as possible. And so there's a similar, similar concept with, with tensor uh, contractions, uh, contractions of tensor networks. And so uh, to illustrate this, I will give you another example, which is shown here, both schematically and explicitly. In this tensor network, you will see there are no legs sticking out anywhere. All the legs, uh, all the bonds, I, J, K, L, M, connect uh, two tensors. So it means that in the end, I need to sum, um, multiply and sum uh, over all the, all the indices, which means in the end, I should get a scalar. So let's try to do this. And now I'm going to do this just in the schematic um, language just to <clears throat> just conserve space and uh, not show you a million indices. Um, but the underlying operations that are happening are again, these, these, uh, uh, these summations over indices. So suppose I start with the two top uh, tensors. These have three, three legs each, and I decide to contract their common uh, index. So, Basically, this orange thing to the right is merged into the purple thing. And then uh, this is what I get uh, in the middle, this, uh, this purple bond or dark purple bond uh, connecting with two bonds to these other two uh, tensors. Then uh, I decide to contract uh, the yellow into the purple and I get uh, this uh, green one. And then I do the final contraction and I get a scalar. So that's one way to do this. There's another way, uh, there are several ways, but another way is to start with this uh, uh, purplish and uh, yellow one and contract these first. Then um, I contract the top two next. Then I end up with just two tensors that I contract again and get a scalar. So these both, these uh, two schedules of contraction um, they both contract the same tensor network. They give the same result if done exactly. But notice the difference. Uh, after the first step in schedule number one, I, I get a tensor that has four indices. Now, if suppose that these indices all have the same, same dimension, they take the same number of values in uh, say two, right? If I have three indices, I have a two by two by two tensor. If I have a four uh, indices, I have a two by two by two by two. So each index I have extra multiplies the size, the overall size of the object that I create. And so this means that um, I really need to be as frugal as possible um, when I decide my contraction schedule, okay? The tensor network tells me that these are all the indices that need to be summed but I need to decide the order, okay? So um, this is in general how tensor network contraction works uh, of any arbitrary tensor network. Of course, if you have an easy geometry like the line that I showed you before, all the tensors in a line, it's easier to, to, to find the order. It's trivial in a sense. Um, but uh, when the, the tensor network is arbitrary, then, um, then things get more difficult. Um, just as a general, uh, to give you a general idea what people do with tensor networks. Um, uh, I would say the primary application so far has been in quantum many body physics, but this is rapidly changing. So in quantum many body physics, uh, people have used tensor networks to, to find ground states of interacting Hamiltonians, particularly in one dimension precisely for the reason that I mentioned earlier that one dimension is somehow easier to deal with 
uh, uh, but also there has been some success in applying tensor network uh, methods to higher dimensional systems, particularly 2D systems. Um, another application of tensor networks is to decompose higher, high dimensional uh, structures into uh, tensor networks. And that is um, essentially for compression. Right? So instead of having, um, uh, having a big two by two by two by two, whatever, uh, suppose uh, I have a, a data structure, I decompose it into a tensor network and, I, and in this way I, I am allowed to, to, uh, to compress uh, any redundancies. Um, more recently, people have started uh, using um, tensor networks in machine learning, in particular for representing neural networks. And, um, and uh, tensor networks also have found uh, application mostly on the theoretical, as a theoretical tool in quantum information. But this is also rapidly changing. People are using uh, tensor networks for, for practical applications like, um, like studying error correcting codes. Okay, so the purpose of this talk is to, to, to talk about computation and I will start directly with quantum computation because it, it, um, it encompasses also classical computation in a sense. Um, so in quantum computation, we have quantum states. Quantum states are uh, vectors in Hilbert spaces and, um, and a qubit is a state in a, in a two-dimensional Hilbert space. So this is what I'm writing, writing here. Psi is the state of a qubit. Zero and one are orthonormal basis states in this Hilbert space. And hence, I can write down a, a qubit state as a, as a vector. And I already showed you that uh, vectors are uh, considered as tensors. And then I can go back to my diagrammatic notation and have uh, write, it, write my state um, uh, like this, where I have a free index that tells me which entry of the vector I am addressing. The next thing that we need uh, for quantum computation, at least in the circuit model of quantum computation, is quantum gates. And quantum gates take one state, uh, uh, apply a unitary, and give me another state. This is a unitary matrix. And uh, if, it is a, if it is a quantum gate uh, acting on one qubit, uh, then it is a simple two by two matrix. And if it's acting on more qubits, say like two qubits, then it will be a four by four matrix. Um, it will take the state of two qubits and map it to another state of two qubits. And then um, if that's the case, then that's all I need to write down quantum circuits. So this cartoon here in the bottom left is, is supposed to be an arbitrary quantum circuit. Here I'm writing only two, two qubit gates because the, the single qubit gates are easier to, to deal with. In fact, I can just embed them into the two qubit gates. Um, and um, in fact, this, this cartoon here, even though it looks simple, this, this uh, circuit picture is enough to, to express any, any possible quantum computation you want, okay? But now what I'm going to do is, I'm going to do uh, simply a reshape of all these gates that are four by four matrices and, um, and kind of separate each index and write, write the four by four uh, gate as a two by two by two by two tensor. Okay, this is literally just the same entries. It's just I reshaped the, the four by four matrix into a tensor. And now you see that uh, if I do this, I can go from the quantum circuit on the left to a tensor network on the right. So whatever expressive power I have on the left, I also have on the right. Okay, so this, this particular example is, is, um, is nice in the sense that uh, I start from a grid, uh, this brick wall structure, and on the other, on the other uh, side, I get a, a square lattice of tensors that is just rotated by 45 degrees. Um, so, and in this case, when you have ordered structures, then that's where condensed matter physicists have developed a lot of techniques to, to work with these. Uh, so like coarse graining and doing uh, 
doing procedures that are uh, morally equivalent to uh, to the renormalization group in certain cases. Um, but now uh, let's look at um, let's look at an example from real life. In in real life, we when we write quantum circuits is because we want to simulate some quantum algorithm or some quantum uh, uh, procedure. And one example of such a procedure is is shown here uh, in this uh, in this illustration that I uh, copied from this from this paper uh, that came out last year. Uh, in this in this application uh, of quantum computation, uh, these people from Google they built a quantum chip, a quantum processor that r literally runs these quantum circuits, and um, they were interested in a particular task which is not very useful in general. Uh, in fact, uh, it is pretty useless if you think about it. Uh, it's just uh, writing random circuits uh, and running them on this, on this uh, quantum chip and asking what, what classical resources it would take to simulate uh, um, the measurement of, of the output state of such a circuit. Okay, so the circuit structure in this case is, is, uh, is two dimensional. So you have your qubits in a 2D grid and uh, the gates live, um, the gates live at, um, um, sorry, the, your qubits live, live here in these colored, um, um, in fact, sorry, the qubits live here in these pluses in this uh, X's and then you have the gates uh, across uh, qubits. And so the motivation behind doing this, um, as I said, is to really show that there is a computation that they can do with their existing hardware that is not possible to achieve with any classical, with any classical computer in any reasonable amount of time. And so uh, here I'm showing uh, the result. Uh, uh, basically they, they came up with this benchmark that they called uh, the cross entropy benchmark. It doesn't really matter what this is. What matters is that in order to, to, to obtain these data points, you need to uh, sample a certain number of, um, of measurements, of, uh, basically do a certain number of measurements at the output uh, of the circuit. And simulating even a single measurement classically is hard. And so this is what they're estimating here that to simulate classically this curve, you have a, an exponentially increasing uh, computational cost. And here at the largest, this, is, this number of cycles basically tells you how many operations you apply, uh, how many quantum gates in a sense, layers of quantum gates you apply. And uh, they show that uh, this steadily increases uh, exponentially and they show, you know, these kind of fantastic uh, figures here that uh, it would take uh, more than 10,000 years to, to compute uh, this data point here with a certain error um, in the biggest supercomputer on the planet, whereas they can do it in, in seconds on the, on the quantum chip. Okay, so this this looks uh, this looks pretty incredible, um, and uh, you know clearly by this estimate we are doomed, right? So, so but we're going to try and do it anyway. Um, so let's use the mapping that we that we learned from the previous slide uh, about how to to write quantum circuits as as tensor networks and see how a tensor network for these circuits in particular would look like. And so here I'm showing you an illustration of how, how such a tensor network looks like. Uh, and it looks really like a mess, right? So it's a, it's a high, high dimensional structure. It is not clearly regular, although there are some, some uh, there is some structure um, because these circuits are chosen at random. So these gates here that connect qubits are chosen at random. There is some some structure, but not quite. So uh, it's pretty much an unstructured. Can be dealt with as an unstructured um, uh, network. 
Um, this is to be contrasted with the thing that I was showing you before, which is really nice and regular, okay? So because this, um, this structure is random, uh, our intuition from the condensed matter side that I was telling you before of coarse graining and doing RG-like procedures is not directly applicable. So the question becomes, um, going now into more into how, how would I, I have, I have, I have written a tensor network that, that represents the computation. Now, how would I enact it? Like how, how would I contract this tensor network to, to get the answer and simulate the quantum circuit? Um, and the idea here is really simple. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I will show you just uh, the cartoon version. Uh, and if there are any questions, we can, we can discuss this further. So here, what I'm showing is uh, a cartoon picture of a tensor network that, that is uh, really unstructured. Uh, and instead of showing edges, I've put this gray area to represent a, a density of edges because my, my drawing skills are not, uh, are not good enough. So um, the idea here is to try and, uh, first of all, let me just make a point. Uh, if, if I were to start, um, um, if I were to start contracting at an arbitrary point in this tensor network and I started contracting things uh, into a single tensor that I chose at some point, then it becomes clear really quickly that, that this procedure is very far from being optimal. In fact, you end up with very, very large tensors. So you need to, you need to somehow, um, you need to somehow do your contraction in a sort of distributed sort of way. Um, so the idea here is as follows. Um, I have this big tensor network that I'm representing by this, uh, by this cartoon here. And what I'm going to find is uh, a way to, to cut it in half in such a way that the cut that I made is more or less balanced. The partition that I made is more or less balanced, meaning I'm cutting more or less my tensor network into ha half, half and half. Uh, but at the same time, I'm demanding that I'm cutting as few bonds as possible. Um, so I, I'm, I'll cut it in half and then I'll uh, cut the, each of the halves in half and so on and so forth. So in the end, what I will get is a hierarchy of separators that uh, pictorially looks like this. So I have a main, my first cut that roughly cuts the, the, the whole network in half. Then I cut each half in half and so on and so forth until, um, until I reach pretty much the individual tensor uh, level. And then what I'm going to do is I'm gonna take this separator hierarchy uh, that, that I built uh, in this way, and then I'm gonna follow it backwards in order to do uh, the contraction. And so I will pick um, the smallest regions and contract all the, the tensors therein. Then I'll pick the next smallest region, uh, contract all the tensors therein and so on, until I arrive at the, the the final contraction to be made, which is two big tensors uh, that have to be contracted together. But what has happened here? Because, because I've chosen all these separators to be as, um, as short as possible, in a sense that they cut as few bonds as possible, then I end up with as small tensors as possible for my final contraction. And this happens basically uh, all along the hierarchy. And then in the end, what I have to do is just contract my final tensors in and get my answer. Okay. So this is it. This is the main idea of, uh, of these bad contraction algorithms uh, for unstructured tensor networks. Okay. And again, I want to stress this again. These are all bad. They will all scale exponentially. This is uh, this for sure. Um, and so here's a list of bad contraction algorithms uh, in, um, 
in, in order of decreasing badness, in a sense. So the, the, the first one is just exhaustively search all possible ways to contract the tensor network and find the optimum. Now, um, this, it is clear that uh, there are many, many ways to contract a tensor network and finding the optimum is, as you can imagine, a hard task. And in fact, is provably hard. In the worst case, it belongs to uh, one of these uh, uh, complexity classes that people classify problems in. Uh, and it's, it is in fact uh, NP-hard. Uh, then what you might say is that, um, okay, let me try the greedy approach, meaning uh, it's the, the, uh, the approach that they illustrated in one of the first slides where, well, I see locally one, one contraction gives me a tensor with four legs, the other one gives me one with three after I contract. So let me pick the one that gives me the, the smallest maximum uh, tensor dimension post-contraction and do this after each contraction. Now, if you try to do this, this behaves pretty bad. Um, so what you, wanna, what you wanna do is kind of relax the constraint of being super greedy all the time. And you might uh, do that by adding some sort of uh, uh, temperature, quote unquote. So you write something like e to the minus beta, some cost, where cost is basically the, 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 the size, the maximum size of the tensors that arise after a contraction. And then you allow this beta uh, to, be, uh, to be a finite value and you do some sort of metropolis-like uh, uh, procedure or process for contraction that allows you to sometimes go up in cost to avoid uh, falling into a, into a trap in a sense. Then um, a slightly more sophisticated uh, approach is this thing that's called a tree decomposition of the line graph. Um, I'm just putting it here because it is, it was important historically uh, because it, um, it showed that the contraction of tensor networks is fixed parameter tractable. Meaning if the tensor network is close to a tree, then uh, suppose that it is exactly a tree, then there's a trivial way to contract it. You start from the leaves, contract them into the, their common uh, ancestor, and keep going like this. And uh, you can always do this in polynomial time. Now, if your, if your um, tensor network is not quite a tree, you can kind of try and bring it uh, uh, towards a tree uh, structure by doing this tree decomposition. Another approach is this thing that I call community detection. This looks at the network and, and tries to figure out subsets of the vertices in the network, of the nodes in the network that uh, are more connected amongst themselves than with the rest of the network. That's called a community. Um, and this, uh, this performs better because it looks, it looks at a, it looks at a tensor network, at a network from a more global perspective, instead of like the greedy approach where you look always just locally, you look at the whole thing. Um, and that allows you to find better, uh, better, larger partitions of the network. And then finally uh, is this balanced graph partitioning, which is pretty much the cartoon that I showed you in the previous slides, um, where uh, you just really try to cut your, cut your uh, tensor network in half, um, such that you cut as few bonds as possible. Now, all these methods have some internal parameters. For example, the, the Boltzmann greedy bubbling has this temperature that I told you about. The balanced graph partitioning has an imbalance parameter, which tells you, do I, do I uh, which fixes whether I really have to cut the network in half, meaning really half and half the, the nodes on each side, or whether I am allowing some imbalance. And this imbalance is a parameter that you, can, uh, that you can play with. And so what one can do is one can allow all these methods to search for contraction paths and uh, vary also their parameters uh, to look for better contraction paths. Uh, and this is called hyperparameter because it doesn't really affect the, the outcome of the contraction itself. Contraction always comes out the same. The result is always the same. 
um, but it does affect the performance. And what I will show you is that it does affect it quite a bit. Um, so let's look at uh, some completely arbitrary structures for these networks. And in particular, we'll be looking at random regular graphs. These are uh, networks where each vertex or each node is connected to uh, exactly K other uh, neighbors. Um, and here I'm showing results for K equals three, four, and five. And um, here on the, on the X axis, this absolute V is number of vertices in, this, in these graphs. And the, the Y axis is what I call this contraction cost. Uh, and literally th this you can take literally as floating point operations that would need to be done or a multiple thereof of all the floating point operations that would need to be done for me to fully contract the network represented, uh, the tensor network represented by these random graphs. And here are the different curves and different points uh, represent different methods. So I can tell you like quick BB and flow cutter are um, these tree decomposition algorithms. B greedy is this Boltzmann greedy. GN is the community structure. Uh, this K high par is, um, is graph partitioning. And optimal is the optimal result where we have exhaustively searched and found really the optimal uh, contraction. So what does this tell us? Um, what, is this, what do these figures tell us? Um, one thing that can be read off of these quite clearly is that uh, in many cases, the greedy local approach, even if you do these tricks to play with temperature, is far from optimal. Like the thing that would be intuitive uh, to do for, for uh, regular structures or lattices and so on, which you would locally bubble uh, things, this doesn't work for unstructured uh, networks. And uh, the second thing is that by, by optimizing uh, these, uh, these contractions, you can gain quite a lot in performance. You see, this is, this is, these are semi-log scale. So these are exponential benefits in a sense. And in fact, uh, for some of the the approaches, I think here is the graph partitioning one, you get pretty close to the optimal. Of course, the optimal we can only evaluate for really small graphs here. And that is because uh, it just becomes prohib prohibitive really quickly uh, to, to find the optimal. So what this tells us is that um, some of the heuristics we can build with this intuition of kind of like trying to cut in half uh, um, approximately uh, can, ye can, can yield near optimal results. Okay, so this is just a benchmark with random, random graphs. Now let's look at the real benchmark, which is, okay, how does it perform for the actual circuits run on these, on these quantum devices? Okay, and here I'm showing results for the Google devices. Google has built through the years a number of, of these quantum chips. And, um, and so um, here I'm showing for three of these. Uh, the first one is the 49 qubit machine. This is a 70 qubit machine. This is the latest one, 53 qubit machine for which the, they, uh, they claim this one supremacy uh, results. And um, here the X axis is depth. In these cases, the first two cases depth is really, um, number of, of uh, layers of gates that I have applied. And here in this case, it's cycles. They count, they count slightly differently in this case. You can imagine that a slice is roughly, uh, sorry, a, a sorry, a cycle is roughly eight, eight layers of gates. So it's a lot, it's a lot of gates. Um, and on the, on the Y axis again is this contraction cost. And so what do we see? So here I've included another approach, this QFlex, uh, which is um, uh, Google's own uh, contractor. And that one kind of uses the, it's not greedy, 
but it uses again this reasoning from from condensed matter where I now think of my circuit as a regular structure and I try to compress or contract one dimension first end up with a with a two-dimensional structure and then try to again coarse grain that so um, looking at these results um, oh here here I have not included the optimal because it's impossible to to find the optimum in any reasonable time. Um, so what we find again here is that um, these, th all these methods perform differently for different uh, architectures. It seems like uh, this idea of graph partitioning works best for these cases at least. And uh, in fact gives again, orders of magnitude of, uh, of speed ups and uh, I want to focus on this case here on the on the right on the sycamore circuits where you get uh, several orders of magnitude as a speed up uh, compared to other methods and in fact um, you can try and put some numbers to this and uh, estimate the speed up that you would get uh, if you if you followed the same the same reasoning as the Google people in their paper so this is a speed up estimate for the largest circuits they were able to run. Um, largest in the sense of uh, both number of qubits and depth in number of cycles. So the estimate of Google, the speed up is just one. It's the, the, est the original estimate. Now with our uh, bad algorithms, we get a speed up of approximately 10,000. And then uh, subsequent work that uh, applied similar techniques to ours, these, these uh, global techniques that kind of cut in half and then cut in half again. Uh, they, they, uh, they followed that with some local moves that uh, locally optimized and rearranged the contraction schedule. And they obtained another factor of 10 on top of, uh, on top of us. And so what does this mean? This means that uh, these estimates that I showed you before uh, about 10,000 years to, to simulate uh, the, the circuits, they, they come down to about 20 days. Okay, so that's a pretty significant speed up uh, in terms of, uh, of simulation effort, right? Of computational cost. So, okay, does this, what does this mean? Does it mean um, uh, that it was all uh, a hoax or like, is it, is it, uh, is this quantum supremacy claim, is it over? Um, and I think the important thing to remember here is, uh, I've put it here in smaller letters. All these estimates are, we have not done these simulations because it is pointless to try and simulate this, right? Because it's not like you're solving any useful problem. So you just estimate how long it would take to simulate this but you estimate how long it would take to simulate it on Summit. Summit is the biggest supercomputer, uh, at least it was at the time uh, they wrote this paper. I don't know if it still is, but it's a very big supercomputer. Uh, so the fact that it takes only 20 days on Summit, uh, it's still on Summit, right? And on the other hand, the original task was done in, uh, I think a couple hundred seconds on a quantum chip. So um, on the classical side, we are pushing back on the original estimates for how long this would take, but that does not mean that the, the result uh, that was obtained with these quantum circuits uh, is not significant, right? Uh, in fact, I think it's, uh, it's a friendly competition here, at least that's the way I see it, of uh, quantum versus classical simulation to try and push the technology further. Okay, um, one final thing, I, if I have, do I have a couple more minutes, Joseph? Sure, yes. So one final thing is because I promised you also classical computation. Um, I wanna show you how to embed uh, classical problems in the same way as we embedded the, the quantum problem. Now, intuitively you might think this is possible because quantum circuits in a sense contain classical circuits, all possible classical circuits also. Um, so here I wanna focus on, on this problem called model counting, which is equivalent to satisfiability, the counting of, of solutions of satisfiability problems. 
So here, instead of qubits, I have bits, which are my variables that take value zero or one, and these are classical, and I have nx of them. So these bits, instead of applying gates to them, what I apply is these clauses. And uh, these clauses are basically um, the uh, disjunctions between these variables, meaning xp or xq or xr for this example. This has a value of zero or one, true or false. And then what I do is I take a conjunction of all these clauses, meaning they all need to evaluate to true simultaneously. And so the, the question whether this formula has assignments uh, for the variables that satisfy the entire formula is called satisfiability, the satisfiability problem. And uh, that is NP-complete, is a, one of the prototypical uh, problems for the complexity class NP-complete. Um, and the question uh, of, instead of asking whether it has or not satisfiable assignments, the question of how many assignments satisfy the formula uh, is even harder, and it is sharp p complete. And sharp p is the is the complexity class for, for counting problems instead of decision problems. So if I can embed a problem like this um, into a tensor network, it means that I can embed basically any problem in class sharp p. Um, so how would we go about doing this? We can try to do this as, as before, right? So each xi is a vector. I can consider it a vector of two possibilities for each variable. So the variable can be zero or one. And um, if there are no constraints, each one represents a solution. So I make a vector and put a one solution, uh, a one representing one solution in each of the entries. Now um, I'm gonna generalize this and actually um, uh, write, write the, the, the tensors that represent variables like this uh, as these delta, Kronecker deltas. And the reason why I'm doing this is that a variable might, part might participate in multiple clauses, but I want the variable that participates in all these clauses to be the same, right? So the way I do this is um, I put uh, xi in one of the clauses, xj in, one, in another, and xk in the third one, say, and then I demand that all three of them are equal. All three variables have the same value. And this is what this delta thing represents here. That's just allow me, allowing me to put the same variables in multiple clauses. Now the clauses can over also be represented by tensors and then the, the value is straightforward, meaning if xp or xq or xr evaluates to one, which uh, happens for seven out of eight possible configurations of these variables, then just put one, return one otherwise return zero. So if they're all zero, the value of the tensor is zero. If otherwise it is one, right? Because for each configuration, I'm allowing one solution. And so now with this convention, the formula again looks like a random structure, like a graph like this. It's a bipartite graph where the white dots here represent the variables and the red dots represent the clauses. And so now I can play the same game as before, right? I, uh, this, this is a tensor network. I have these, uh, these techniques, I have holding the hammer in a sense. So wherever I see a nail, I'm just uh, hitting. Um, and so here are some results uh, for two, two different classes of these counting problems. They are both hard. Um, the reason, so, okay, for those of you who know what these mean, uh, fine. Uh, but uh, for the rest of you, these are just versions of the, the problem that I showed you before. And here I'm showing the performance of three tensor network techniques. Greedy is the greedy thing that I described before, but without the temperature stuff. Metis is again graph partitioning, just a different method. And GN is the community structure. And I'm comparing this to the, the champion holder, in a sense that the champion of the, of the uh, solvers for these sort of counting problems. These, these satisfiability problems, both the decision and the counting version, they show up, they crop up a lot and people have decades of experience in, in, in developing solvers for these, uh, for these problems. 
uh, even though they are exponential. So again, all these algorithms are bad. Um, and so what we see here is uh, it's runtime on the y-axis and number, number of vertices or number of variables, or number of half the vertices in this case, number of all the vertices in this case, um, is the comparison in performance. And we see eventually we reach, uh, we reach a, a regime where we have a clear exponential scaling for all the, all the bad algorithms here. But the, the, the punchline is that uh, all the tensor network algorithms in this case are perform the, the previously best known classical, uh, classical in the sense traditional solver. And in this case, they, um, they slightly underperform, but, uh, but they have a, an absolute, uh, uh, at least two of them here, you see have an absolute, again, in absolute numbers. And then if you try to, to see where these, these lines would, would cross, they, you find something like you know, several times the age of the universe. So for all practical purposes, these methods are faster uh, for now. So uh, a couple of remarks about this. Uh, one is that, okay, clearly there are, exist classes for which these tensor networks met tensor network methods uh, outperform other solvers, um, there's a lot of room for, for improvement also because uh, this, this paper is earlier. We did way less of the optimization tricks. And in fact, these, uh, these are scripts that are a couple hundred lines that I wrote in, in Python. Um, so way fewer tricks, no hyperparameter optimization, no searching, no nothing. So there's a lot of room for improvement. And in fact, uh, I think it's a, it might be a timely, um, a timely finding because this year there was the first model counting competition. People, people who develop these methods, they, they, they compete uh, uh, at least for the decision problems. And this year it was the first competition for the counting problems. So, so uh, you know, we might, we might enter next year. In fact, we tried our, our improved algorithms on the, on the instances from this year. And uh, for some of the problems, we, we found that we, we even beat the winners for this year. So, um, and um, another thing that I wanted to mention here is that uh, once we came up with these results, uh, we, uh, the computer scientists were also quite intrigued. So in Moshe Vardi's group uh, from Rice, uh, they're using now um, tensor network, tensor network, tensor network methods for, for these uh, problems as well. So um, that's all I wanted to, uh, to tell you today. So let me try and, and sum up. Um, the first, the most important point that I want you to take away uh, from this talk is really that tensor networks uh, can, uh, are expressive enough to, to model computations, both classical and quantum. Um, so they are a nifty tool uh, just to express these computations. But also, um, even though there might not be uh, good algorithms for, for uh, actually doing the, the simulation of embedded in the tensor network, uh, the bad algorithms are, can be quite good. Uh, and in fact, uh, they can beat other algorithms there. They can be competitive. And uh, I showed you these examples of quantum circuits or model counting, but there's many other problems this could be applied to. Uh, coloring, graph coloring. We did another study here of, uh, that maps to a partition function, uh, like a statmic partition function. But uh, in fact, it, it, uh, it is the evaluation of not invariance. So basically how to untie your shoelaces. So uh, that's in this paper. Um, Another important remark is that all the algorithms that I showed you so, so far are exact. There is no approximation made at any point, except for maybe the, the numerical accuracy, the, the numerical precision in, of the computer, of the representation on the computer itself. But other than that, there's no approximation made. So that, that leaves uh, a lot of room for improvement and also the potential open for getting good algorithms, meaning algorithms that scale polynomially. And in fact, uh, this is a line of research that we are pursuing right now, where we um, 
are employing these sort of techniques, but with uh, truncations um, of the dimensions of the tensors to um, to implement decoders for multi-qubit uh, quantum error correcting codes. Um, in another application that I didn't uh, talk about because I don't know much about it, but it's becoming more and more active. So you will probably hear it uh, uh, being uh, thrown around is uh, tensor network methods in machine learning. Um, there's uh, quite, uh, quite a lot of activity in this, uh, in this uh, subfield currently. And um, this is something that uh, we are interested, we are starting to pursue in my group also. So that's it. I will happily take any questions now. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Stephanos, for a very uh, thought-provoking talk. So any questions from the audience? Maybe I'll start with one. So, um, so you mentioned that in the case of these sort of unstructured random structures, maybe there's not much intuition coming from physics because we're used to looking at these regular lattice structures. But is, could there be cases in which uh, one could borrow physics, you know, the intuition from the physics of disordered systems? Uh, you know, there are things like localization that might emerge in very large uh, sets of networks that could help understanding the, uh, the properties, at least maybe in some approximate way. Yeah, so I might have been a bit too self-deprecating there uh, because um, in fact, the intuition about um, about cutting the system in half in a, way, in a way such that you cut as few bonds as possible, it is kind of physics motivated. Uh, if you think of these bonds as entanglement in the quantum picture, uh, then um, an approximation to the entanglement, if you know about Rennie entropies and so on, Rennie zero is the Schmidt rank. So if I, if I were to contract and decompose these tensors uh, locally, I would get uh, a certain number of singular values if I did an SVD. Uh, and in the number of these singular values is the Rennie zero entropy. So basically what you're doing is trying to minimize entanglement. Uh, as, as you do these contractions. So certainly, certainly the, the intuition from physics is useful in developing these tools. Okay, so the sort of DMRG type idea kind of can be applied in these, in these uh, unstructured systems. Yeah. yeah, in fact, that's what we're, do what we're doing for decoding. I see. Thank you. Any other questions? don't see any questions. So I think we'll uh, conclude here. So first, uh, let us thank Stephanos again for a very interesting talk. Thank, thank you. you.